Currency manipulation. Hi, I'm Dave Arnott, the Christian economist. Our subject today could have been subtitled, What Determines the Values of Currencies? And the short answer is the market. You know, this is one of these fascinating subjects I've said to my students many times in the classroom at Dallas Baptist University. You know, the world is not as tightly wrapped as you wished it was. You know, going back to the U.S., is gross domestic product growing or shrinking? Are we in a growth or a recession period right now? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell doesn't know. President Donald Trump doesn't know. <clears throat> the latest winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics doesn't know. Dave Arnott doesn't know. Nobody knows. The world is not as tightly wrapped as we wished it was. And this is where we get the Christian part of it. Look, unless you believe in some greater being, the world is just totally afloat. And so this is where you get these strange uh, conspiracy ideas like the Bilderbergers in Europe must control the world economy. But the only reason those kinds of conspiratorial theories come about is because people just have trouble accepting that the world is not tightly wrapped, that it's on its own. <laughs> it's, it's heading where it's going to go, and no one controls it. And so that's our subject today, which is currency manipulation. Here's an example I did in class last week. So we talk about this baseball pitcher named Clayton Kershaw, who happens to be from the Dallas area, spoke at DBU at our baseball banquet a few years ago. Seems like a fine young man. Uh, the Dodgers won the World Series this year mostly because of Clayton Kershaw. So I put on the board a, a factor with just on the top it says how many games is he going to win. Let's say the Dodgers claim he's going to win 20 games on the top of, of the equation. On the bottom of the equation, I've got they're going to pay him $20 million. Okay, they pay him more than that, but I'm trying to make the math easy, right? He's supposed to win 20 games and paid $20 million. You divide 20 by 20, you get one. If he wins 22, the value of the Kershaw, got it, just went from 1 to 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah, it's that simple. Back up. Let's say they expect him to win 20 games and they're paying him 20 million. If he wins only 18, <clears throat> 18 divided by 20, the value of the Kershaw as a currency just went from 1 to 0.9. Well, all you do is on the top of that equation, you change games to GDP, which is easy because the word game starts with G. So you just take a red pen and over the other four letters of the word games, you write GDP. And on the bottom, you leave it dollars. And you've got what determines the current value of any national currency. I just made up the Kershaw. So there's a Kershaw, and then there's the United States dollar, there's a Canadian dollar, there's a the Mexican peso, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are they all worth? They are worth what that equation determines. What is the production on the top of the equation? How many dollars are supporting that production? And you have the value of a currency. But there's dozens of currencies all over the world, aren't they? So how do you set these currencies' values, or <laughs> does the world, or does anybody? Point number one. Uh, in our upcoming book, Biblical Economic Policy, Sergei Sadamatov and I say that there are ten commandments of biblical economics, and I'm, four of them fit into this equation today. The first one is people should be free, meaning currencies should float. Simply, you can say that currencies are in one of three different categories, fixed, pegged, or floating. I was in Vietnam one time, and the currency was fixed. The Vietnamese dong was fixed at 20,000 20, dong per U.S. dollar. But you could go to a black market shop just down the road and get it for 23,000, which our guy did. <laughs> so they fixed it, and it stays the same every day because the government fixes the, the price of the dong relative to either the euro or the U.S. dollar, but it's fixed. It's not going to change. The second, <clears throat> more, second in terms of control, a little less control, is pegged. Well, I was in Hong Kong uh, one time, and I exchanged some money for Hong Kong dollars, and I think it was 6.8. And being a good shopper, every day we'd pass by a shop, I'd look at the, at the price, and you know what? It was the same every day. <laughs> I found out later that's because it's pegged. It is pegged to the U.S. dollar. So it goes up with the dollar and down with the dollar. Now, so we've talked about the Vietnamese dong being fixed, the Hong Kong dollar being pegged. The third is floating, and most, most major national currencies float. 
that means the market determines what is the value of the U.S. dollar versus the euro versus the Chinese uh, yuan versus the Japanese yen versus the Mexican peso. They float, right? And that's the market. So if we look at our concepts of Christian economics from biblical economic policy by Dave Arnott and Sergei Sudamatov, we adopt the first one. People should be free. In other words, these currencies should be free to float and to gain their own relative value to each other. But back to my first equation, what is it? How much product productivity on the top of the equation, how many dollars or currencies or pesos, whatever, are supported by that? That equation determines the value of a currency relative to one another. And we'd also look at, uh, from biblical economic policy, a second of the 10 biblical economics, uh, Ten Commandments of Biblical Economics. This one's called Honest Measures. And so from the Old Testament, we use scriptures to say we should use honest measures when we're doing things. Well, the market, the floating currency, is a more honest measure than a fixed or a pegged. I'll tell you a story. Mrs. Arnott and I were in uh, Argentina a couple of years ago. <clears throat> the Argentine government had fixed the peso, the Argentine peso, at six to the U.S. dollar. Well, I couldn't get my ATM card to work, and it turned out that was a blessing, actually, because via the, the bank, I was going to get only six Argentine pesos per U.S. dollar. It wouldn't work. Anyway, we had enough money to get through the day. As we're walking down a shopping street, every block, there'd be a nice-looking young, Bra uh, I almost said Brazilian, nice-looking Argentine man saying to us, cambio, cambio, meaning change. Do you want to change dollars for Argentine pesos, because he knows the government will only give you six. He was going to give us ten. We stopped in two stores that day. One of them exchanged the dollar at 12, the other 15. What is the real rate of the Argentine peso? See, this is a fascinating one-hour experiment that Mrs. Arnott and I had on a shopping street in Argentina. The government says there's six to the dollar. The cambio guy says 10. The stores say 12 to 15. What is an honest measure? The market. See, in the store, they're exercising the market. The Argentine government is trying to say there's, it only takes six of them to buy a dollar, but in one of the stores it said 15. What is the most honest measure? Well, we get these two concepts here. People should be free to trade at whatever they want. In other words, it should float, but it's not floating. The market says it's worth 15. The government says it's worth six. Here's how U.S. currency gets set. Now, I've, I've given you these uh, three ideas of fixed, pegged, floating. As in all education, you start with the simple and then it becomes more complex. There's all kinds of variants in between fixed, pegged, and floating. Pegged meaning, what do you peg it to? Just the U.S. dollar or the U.S. and the euro? Uh, these things get really complex after you get about a 12-minute podcast that I'm doing today. This is really a complex subject that I'm trying to make simple. So here's what the U.S. does. Our Federal Reserve determines money supply and interest rates. And so it's a simple exchange of treasury notes for dollars. That's it. People are often fascinated. How do you increase the money supply? Well, here's how it happens. The Federal Open Market Committee meets about every six weeks. And at the end of that meeting, they turn to John Williams, who is now the, the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And they say to him, go to Wall Street and exchange pieces of paper, as they used to be, they're now electronic, pieces of paper that say treasury bond for dollars, and exchange those until the interest rate gets where we want it to be. Now, the interest rate is the price of money. So they turn to John Williams. Currently, as I'm recording this in November of 2020, the target interest rate for the Fed is between a, a range of 0 to 0.25%. Why it's so low is another podcast. But it is very low. Let's say they want to raise it. At the end of the meeting, they turn to John Williams and say, go to Wall Street and, and decrease the money supply. As you decrease the money supply, each dollar comes, the interest rate goes up, right? And that's what they do. It's that simple. They exchange pieces of paper for dollars. That's how they increase or decrease the money supply. So is it really floating? Well, no, it's not perfectly floating because the Fed can control the interest rate and the money supply. I've told you previously, about four minutes ago, that the U.S. dollar floats. It doesn't perfectly float because the Fed can exchange 
treasury bills for dollars to increase or decrease the money supply, that affects then the interest rate. Now, <clears throat> my subject today is currency manipulation. And so when you heard that title, you probably have thought about President Trump and how he's after the Chinese for manipulating their currency. Well, here's what happens. The Chinese purposely keep the yuan very low. That means their producers are favored so they can sell items to, say, my DBU students in the United States. So who's, who's, who is favored by a low yuan? It's Chinese producers, U.S. consumers. Who is disfavored? And see, they often don't tell you this half. Who is disfavored? U.S. producers and Chinese consumers. And so President Trump, in excoriating the Chinese for lowering the yuan, is saying, don't let Dave's DBU students buy stuff so cheap at Walmart. Really, President Trump? That's your claim? And see, so often I was in the classroom, and I put out one arm and I say, on the one hand, and the case here is, on the one hand, the lower yuan is bad for U.S. producers. I put out the other hand. I say, but on the other hand, it's good for U.S. consumers. Who are you going to favor? Look, there's no free lunch. And this is one of the most important things you learn in economics. There is no free lunch. So President Trump is favoring U.S. producers over U.S. consumers when he's trying to get the Chinese to stop manipulating their currency. My point is, if the Chinese want to manipulate it and make those goods be uh, cheaper for my DBU students to buy at Walmart, good for them. That's fine. I want my students to be, I'd buy cheaper. Look, there's no free lunch. You get one or the other. You either favor producers or consumers. The current market, where the Chinese lower the yuan, <clears throat> favors U.S. producers, I'm sorry, Chinese producers and U.S. consumers. If they raise the yuan, it would favor Chinese consumers <clears throat> and U.S. producers. Who are you going to favor? That's it. There is no free lunch. Okay, where does all this happen? These currencies get exchanged in what's called the Forex exchange market, right? And it's called that, but it doesn't exist in any one specific place. It's all over the world. It is a market. Uh, what the dollar is worth today relative to the euro and the other major currencies of the world is because of the market. People are trading these 24 hours a day. Now, it's centered in three places. 43% of Forex exchange takes place in London. 16% takes place in New York. 7% in a combination of Singapore and Hong Kong, and 5% in Tokyo. If you leave Singapore and Hong Kong out of the equation, this is easy to remember. You have a Europe, <clears throat> European center, which is London, an American center, which is New York, an Asian center, which is Tokyo. And so those are the three places where the majority of Forex exchange takes place. But it's exchange. It's a market. Arbitragers, arbitra arbitrateurs, boy, that's a hard word to say, <clears throat> are daily, hourly, by the minute, buying low currencies and selling high currencies so that the, the market really comes out good. And so it comes out good. Well, this takes us one to one of our other concepts from Biblical Economic Policy by Arnott and Sadamatov, Ten Commandments of Biblical Economics. One of them is trade is good. And so as long as these trades take place, we think it reaches the, the right level. Look, one of the things I say in the classroom the most is look, a market is where everybody votes. That is the most democratic way of making decisions. And trade is good because people are allowed to trade. U.S. currency for Mexican currency, for Japanese currency, for Chinese currency, for the euro. They're allowed to trade. As they trade, it reaches its right level, if you want to say that, because everybody has an input. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements says that this total per day, $6 trillion a day. To give you a comparison there, the U.S. economy annual GDP is around $20 trillion. A third of that happens every day. Six trillion dollars is traded every day. This is good, by the way, because this is a good market. A market is where everybody gets to vote. Okay, and so my last concept with you, you probably during your life sometime run into an existentialist, probably an atheist, who said, I don't believe in anything. You know, I, I don't believe in anything that's, that, that doesn't exist, right? Well, hold up a U.S. dollar and say, do you believe this exists? Actually, it's just a piece of linen. You have faith that the store is going to, give, going to give you goods for this dollar. 
Faith in what? It, the phrase is faith, full faith in the federal government. Who's the government? Us. Didn't I say early in this podcast, the world is not, li- not as tightly wrapped as you wished it was? It's faith. It is faith. What is that dollar going to be worth in the f- future? Depends on what kind of manipulations take place. Look, we all have faith. Everybody has faith in something. And this is where the atheist really fails because he says, I don't have faith in anything unless it's physical. That dollar's not physical. It is a piece of linen that represents. What does it represent? Going back to the Kershaw, as I started with, it represents how much productivity is is guaranteed for how much, how many of those are running around. That's it. It's really simple. It's productivity, games for Kershaw, gross domestic product for us, and on the bottom, how many dollars are chasing that? Yep. Well, currency manipulation. I'm Dave Arnott, the Christian Economist, where our slogan is, fear God, tell the truth, earn a profit. See you next time.